Yogi Berra, the famous baseball player, coach, and manager once said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> Soren Kierkegaard, the existentialist philosopher from the 17th century said, given two possible situations, one can either do this or that, my honest opinion and friendly advice is, do it or don't do it. You will regret both. <laughs> Yogi Berra and Soren Kierkegaard may have offered their tidbits of wisdom many generations apart, but each seems to suggest that when the time comes to make decisions in life, we should embrace the choice and move forward. Life is filled with choices, and there are countless forks in the road to confront. Choosing one road will preclude us from taking the other, which Kierkegaard says we will regret. But as Yogi Berra seems to imply, we should not waste very much time or energy agonizing on which one to take. We need to make our decisions and commit ourselves to their consequences. Tonight, on this Atonement Eve, we prepare ourselves to embrace and address the consequences of the choices we have made. Tonight, we look to craft the next chapter in the Book of Life. We look back, we take accountability, we seek to move forward, and as we engage this challenging process, there are bound to be moments of regret. Regret for things that should have been done. Regret for words that should have been shared. Regret for events that should have been attended. Regret for causes that should have been supported. An important part of Yom Kippur and this season of penitence might be playfully boiled down to the following phrase, woulda, coulda, shoulda. That's it, that's the whole purpose of this season. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. And in addressing these feelings of, of regret, we are engaged in the process of tshuva, a process of returning ourselves to the right path in our relationships with each other and with God. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. In his recent memoir, Born a Crime, Trevor Noah wrote the following about regret. Regret, he says, is the thing we should fear the most. Failure is an answer. Rejection is an answer. But regret, regret is an eternal question you will never have the answer to. Regret is not clean. Regret can be ongoing. With regret, there's often no resolution. And if it is not dealt with in a healthy way, if regret remains an ongoing uh, sense of uncertainty with no outlet, with no healthy, affirming space to process, with no loving vehicle for clemency, regret can easily turn into internalized shame. Before we express, exp explore some healthy ways to face our regrets, allow me to share some of the responses that you sent to me in the survey that I asked uh, from you many months ago about regret. For those who may not have seen it, a few months ago I sent everyone in the congregation a survey which was meant to help me craft tonight's sermon. Thank you all for helping me tonight. This survey contained one single question. 
and that is, please share anything you may have done or did not do in life that you now regret. I regret not giving my marriage a chance. While the path I took was meaningful and fulfilling, to this day I look back and question, what if? I regret being so me-centered in my parenting, which made me less patient with my children. I regret not starting earlier in life, creating wonderful family events for the family. We could have afforded to pay for the entire family vacations 10 years ago, but it was only four years ago that we actually started gathering as an entire family for summer retreats. The cousins delight in being together, and it is such a blessing to reconnect with our children and grandchildren in such a focused way. What would have been inheritance money is now something we can all enjoy as a family. The kids will, will never miss less inheritance, but they would certainly miss the incredible experiences we have shared for the past four years and for many years to come. I regret not being more compassionate and nurturing with my mom during the end stages of her life. I wish I had used those final years as opportunities for big conversations. I regret making so many decisions in my early years that were rooted in fear. I missed out on a lot of things because of fears of being judged, fears of consequences, fears of the unknown. I regret not being more helpful to others when I was doing my best to keep my head above water. If I had only gotten outside of my own problems more often to help those around me, my problems would have been smaller, and so would the problems of those I could have helped. I am a workaholic. While I do not regret my work ethic, I do regret never taking a real vacation. My journeys always ended up being work out of the office trips, which was not fair to me. But even worse, it was not fair to my wife or kids. I regret not asking my father about his childhood and his family stories growing up. He was born in Transylvania when it was part of Hungary. His family emigrated when he was very young. He died when I was 20, and I never learned the stories of my Hungarian heritage. Some folks spend money on things like cars and fancy purses. I do not regret using discretionary cash on travel with my family. Family time goes by fast, and I never wanted to take that for granted. When I was a teen, I would fake being asleep when a lot of family was over. At the time, it kept me from having to socialize when I did not want to. Now some of my elders have passed away and it haunts me to this day. I can never recover the time I lost being able to be with them. I regret not taking the time to learn and understand more about my sister's disease before it took her life. I regret not sharing more with my mom or learning more things from and about her before she passed away. I regret the harsh words and my stubbornness that led to the demise of certain relationships. Every year I put out a flag for our national holidays. And when I do, I feel a twinge of regret. I regret the lack of opportunity to serve our country in a non-military way. I feel our freedoms are often taken for granted. Opportunities to serve our country in a variety of ways could go a long way in helping us appreciate what we have. When my brother lay dying of AIDS in a New York City hospital, the family had gathered there for several days. He was in a coma and for several days we had taken turns at his bedside. Visitors were limited to two people at a time. There was no way to know when he would pass. Having responsibilities at home, I chose to return to take care of our very young children and return to work. Before I left his bedside, I told him I loved him. I pray that he heard me as he passed two days later. I wish to this day 
I regret not being there. I regret reaching my senior years without ever finding a suitable Jewish woman to be my spouse, companion, and best friend. I am 91 years old, and as I look back on my life, I do so without a single regret. I'm filled with gratitude and appreciation for all of my successes and for all the lessons learned from my failings. I regret not enjoying our children more when they were young. I regret not buying a lot more shares of Apple stock. <laughs> These responses show that all of us have very real regrets in our lives. And in reading these, I feel that there are some beautiful themes. The most common theme is that the vast majority of our regrets are rooted in choices we made which prevent us from doing something else. It's not so much what we did, but we, like Kierkegaard warned, often regret the choices we did not make. Almost all of us regret missed opportunities. Whether it was lost time with family, failing to make the right investment at the right time, or missing out on chances to share and learn from others. For so many of us, we regret the experiences we did not choose and the dreams we did not pursue because we made a different choice. I spoke with a few people who really struggled with answering the question in this survey. They had a hard time with the word regret in general. These individuals had made a major decision in life. And looking back, they did indeed have regrets in not pursuing the choice that they had turned down. The choice they did make, however, was a choice that generated tremendous joy and opportunity and fulfillment. So at the end of the day, they were not able to say that they actually regretted how things turned out. They only had a lingering regret connected to that what if. Most of us can relate to what if. Most of us have plenty of what if situations in our lives. Sometimes these situations are truly inconsequential. They fall into Yogi Berra's advice to grab the fork in the road when we see it. But sometimes the what if can linger long in our consciences. And if not properly dealt with, that lingering what if can haunt us throughout our lives in the form of regret and even shame. It is interesting to note that the Hebrew Bible and the Torah, the word regret shares the same root with two other words that are seemingly completely unconnected. Three words are regret, comfort, and to change course or to change one's mind. All three of them are rooted in the letters nun chet mem, nacham. Nacham is the most common, is most commonly translated as, as comfort. The prophet Isaiah cries out to God after the destruction of the temple, Nachamu, Nachamu Ami, comfort my people, O God. Nacham, comfort, is a beautiful, powerful idea, but how is it connected to regret? 
Well, in the book of Genesis, after God creates humanity, God regrets creating human beings altogether after God sees the wickedness that we bring into the world. And in Genesis 6, we read, Vayinachem Adonai ki asa et ha'adam. God regretted making human beings. Vayinachem, regret. Nacham, comfort. But later in the book of Exodus, we find the very same word again. And here, it takes place in the context after the sin of the golden calf. And God wants to destroy all of, hum, uh, all of the Israelites. But Moses gets God to change God's mind and reverse course. And there we read, by Yinachem Adonai, al hara'a asher diber la'asot le'amo. God renounced, God reversed, God changed course in his thoughts for the punishment that God had planned upon the people. This is absolutely fascinating, at least for me. Here we have one word, nacham, in three different contexts. Vayinachem, regret. Vayinachem, to shift course or change mind. And nacham, Comfort. They are so different, and yet this common Hebrew word has so much to offer us at this season. This common Hebrew root, link, linking regret to comfort and thinking differently about situations, has profound implications when we consider the choices we have made which have led to regret. For from a Jewish perspective, comfort seems to begin when we can reframe disappointment and understand it in a broader context. In many ways, Kol Nidre and Yom Kippur serve to remind us that while we need to be accountable for the choices we make, we need not be defined by them. This season of penitence beckons us to recognize the impact of our choices, the good ones as well as the bad ones, and then seek ways to grow and learn. Our task is not to dwell on our misguided choices. Our lives need not be burdened by regret. Rather, the Torah seeks to teach us through the nuances of the Hebrew language that our challenge is to address our regrets and change our course in the quest for comfort. Regret from this perspective is a kind of emotional vessel which compels us to learn, change course, grow, and move on. Tonight especially, our task is not to evade regret, but rather to harness it as a force for positive change. As we now dim the lights in the sanctuary and listen to the hallowed strains of Kol Nidre on the cello, let us reflect on ways to translate remorse into resolution, missteps and missed opportunities into newfound aspirations and missteps into moments of personal discovery, healing, and renewal. Can you hear May it be so.